Welcome to Phylum platyhelminthes. This houses all of our flat worms, and I legitimately mean flat space worms or flatworms. You'll learn about some roundworms, you'll learn about segmented worms, uh, but we're going flat this time around. So let's take a look at their phylogenetic tree before we talk too much about them. So this is the animal phylogenetic tree. Uh, we're at animals that have actual tissues. We're in our bilateral organisms. We're in our protostome branch. And then we're in superphylum Lophotrochozoa. And this video is not going to talk much about what it means to be in superphylum Lophotrochozoa. If you are curious, just know that it's actually one of the life stages of these organisms, but honestly, not that much more important than that. Uh, and then we're found um, with also our mollusks and our annelids. So let's take a little bit closer look into platyhelminthes. So I mentioned earlier, these are called the flat worms, and you might be wondering, are they actually flat? So here's some different examples of flatworms that are found in phylum platyhelminthes, and yes, they are indeed flat. Now, there's not many pictures that people take looking at it from the side, probably because they're so flat and it wouldn't be interesting. Uh, but I tried to find some pictures that kind of showed uh, angles so you could really see this. Now, obviously, these aren't to scale, but to give you an idea of how thick a flatworm is, most flatworms are between 0 0.5 and 1 millimeter thick. Now, there's an evolutionary reason to explain the flatness in these worms. And it has to do with the fact that they're missing a respiratory system. They don't have gills. They don't have lungs. Instead, it's every cell for themselves. <laughs> themselves. <laughs> anyway, so every cell has to get the oxygen they need through diffusion because they don't have a circulatory system or a respiratory system in which oxygen can move around the body. So a cell found in, this is a tapeworm, by the way, you'll learn more about these in a future video, but a cell in the scolex and a cell in the proglottids, they've got to work on their own using diffusion to get the oxygen they need out of the water. Now, the problem is, is if you are too thick and you're relying on diffusion to get the oxygen you need, you're kind of screwed because the cells, let's say you are a round worm and you have to rely on diffusion, the cells found in the middle of this roundness, I'll just use this instead, the cells found in the middle aren't close enough to the outside environment to be able to do diffusion on their own to get the oxygen they need. So if your organism is too large, what happens is the cells in the middle would end up dying and your whole organism would die. So it's really only the flattest worms are able to successfully do oxygen diffusion into their cells. So it does come at an evolutionary advantage. Now let's explore some of the other characteristics we use to describe different animal groups. So first off, we can talk about their symmetry. As you may have noticed in the phylogenetic tree, they are in the bilateria or bilateral group. And you can see that line of symmetry kind of moving down on the lengthwise of flatworms. They are also in the triploblastic branch. Remember, really our only diploblastics, whereas phylum cnidaria or those jellyfish and sea anemones. This means they have three different germ layers, the endoderm, the ectoderm, and that mesoderm. Now these guys are kind of unique uh, when we're talking about coelomates. So since they're a triploblast, we can use one of those three terms. This is our only phylum that we're gonna see that are acelomate. So just to look at this diagram down here, they have that ectoderm in blue, they have that endoderm in yellow, and then the mesoderm completely fills up the space where a coelom could have been, but there is no coelom. So they don't actually have any kind of body cavity, which kind of makes sense. When you're super, super thin and super, super flat, you don't have space for a body cavity. Now, I'm going to skip digestion for a second and jump to the protostome deuterostome. 
So you may have noticed that they're on the protostome branch when we're looking at the phylogenetic tree. And the ancestors of our Panihelminthes were protostomes. Remember, this means you have two openings, which would be complete digestion, and that the uh, mouth is forming first. But Panihelminthes is odd. They almost evolved backwards, which we do see a lot in evolutionary history. So they actually have incomplete digestion. They only have one opening that serves as both the mouth and the anus, meaning we cannot use the term proto or deuterostome for them. And this is really interesting because they were on that protostome branch. And so I'm actually going to go back to that slide just to kind of show you this. So again, we see um, protostomes or complete digestion evolving and when we learn about annelids and mollusks, they also are protostomes, but our platyhelminthes aren't. And as I mentioned before, we see this in other times in evolutionary history. So know that yes, they are in the protostome branch. They share a common ancestor that was a protostome, but for one reason or another, evolutionarily, evolution favored individuals that only had one opening, or maybe they had a reduced second opening and they kept getting favored and favored and they evolved backwards. So because their common ancestor is a protostome and they're still highly related genetically to other organisms, we haven't changed up our phylogenetic tree. But if we were to add a trait on here, we would probably add incomplete digestion on the platyhelminthes. So there you have it. That's phylum platyhelminthes. You got the basic overview on their body plans, and you have learned that, yes, indeed, the flatworms are indeed flat.